done, but uh, I also didn't bring any slides. So what I'd like to talk to you guys about has nothing to do that I can really put on slides without making it really fluffy. So um, I'd really like to get a better background or better, get a better understanding of who's all in the room and what your background is, what your motivation is, why you're interested in the Internet of Things. Can a few people shout out, tell me about yourself? Uh, sure. Tim Anderson, Cancer Detection and Clothing. I came up with a way to detect cancer in the human body through wearable technology. Okay. My name is Hassan Sayed. Um, I basically started a technology incubator two years ago here in Minneapolis by the name Bill Ventures, and we are creating uh, a virtual environment in which people can take these ideas and bring them to, to some, uh, you know, some kind of reality. And Internet of Things is just one big area where people are, have lots of ideas. So I'm looking for okay. And learning more. Okay. Thank you. So, yes. My name is Saad Bedros. I'm at the University of Minnesota, and we support students and staff on how, what to do with these IOTs, what are the services, and what's, what do you do with the data, and how do you, and finally, when they get the solution or the system, how, what, can you start a company or can you monetize whatever system you have? So we support them on these kind of things. Okay, I'll talk to your area, yes. Hey Mark, uh, I'm Mohammed Durman from uh, Team Remo, and I got into IoT because I thought that we could make the world more accessible and interesting for everybody, including people who have disabilities. Yeah. Mohammed and I met. What was it, Mohammed? Start up again? Maybe four years ago. Okay. Hi, Asya Mahal, I'm a designer, uh, and I try to humanize technology. Okay. So if I could ge generally uh, assume everybody here is in industry, is in their careers, it's not so much a studio or student oriented or anything like that. Um, is uh, most people at the research theoretical side or are most people at the application side? Not sure. Not sure? Application. Okay. Application. 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 More application. application. Research. Yeah, research. I mean, when I heard this, when I heard this, <laughs> when I heard this came in the door, it was research oriented, so. Okay. Well, let me tell you a little bit about my background, because I'm sure uh, it's always a curiosity. Uh, back in 2003, I was flying my airplane, a little two-seat uh, experimental home built, and the engine unfortunately died right after takeoff in Flying Cloud uh, by In Prairie, and I had to crash land it down in the Minnesota River Valley. And I uh, obviously survived, but it flipped over upside down, landed on my head with the airplane on top of me, and crushed my neck. So I came out of that uh, first at HCMC. I was in. Uh, intensive, uh, what do you call it? ICU. ICU, thank you. Uh, for 30 some days, which I don't remember, and had all kinds of interesting conversations where I told my uncle to bring me six sheets of that two inch thick pink ins insulation. He said, why? Because I'd like to build a box around my bed and get some sleep. This place is crazy. <laughs> um, and then I went to Sister Kenny, uh, where I still had a halo on. Um, and was working to get off a ventilator, get up in a wheelchair the first time. They said, hey, we're going to give you a wheelchair that you drive by blowing and sucking. And I said, you know what? I can wiggle my arm this much if somebody just like gets rid of gravity. So forget that. I'm going to figure out how to do it this way. And lo and behold, after a little debate, you know, he said, well, if we just hang it in a sling, it's, gravity isn't such a factor anymore. And I went driving away, and they were like, oh, my gosh, didn't think you could do that. Um, and it probably took me about the next hour to go about 50 feet down the hallway because I'd get exhausted every 10 feet. But uh, very quickly, through active use, I rehabilitated my own arm and, and I forced myself to switch arms and, until I could move my arms enough. That, this, that was my functional recovery. Anyway, and then I spent the next eight months at, at Courage Center. And when I was at Courage Center, um, refreshingly, an occupational therapist said the first day, they said, well, we're going to teach you how to live independently. And I said, great, because everybody else has been saying, you know, boy, your option is always to go to a nursing home or live with your parents. And I didn't like either of those options very much. Um, and, uh, and so I came in the first day and they said, what are your goals? And I said, well, here's my cell phone. It's lying in my lap. I can't pick it up. I can't dial it. I can't hold it to my ear. What do you got for me? I'd spent the last three years teaching the cell phone manufacturers how to make those things better, a little easier for all of us to use. And Unfortunately, in my experience doing that, no one ever came. I came back from Korea or Japan or something. Nobody ever said, geez, my cell phone crashed one less time. Thank you. 
So I was looking for a new path anyway in my career. And, and these therapists kind of all looked at each other and said, geez, we don't have anything for you. Here's a rubber pencil holder. Let's work on this. <laughs> and, and I, I thought, you remember clear as day, geez, I could buy that at Target for a dollar. I don't think I need your help. I'm here for experts, right? So I spent the next eight months basically researching what does it mean to be disabled, what's available, and what I learned is there's a heck of a lot that's not available. There's a lot of things for people who had full functional use of their hands and arms and are just push themselves in a manual wheelchair. But if you're a quad, like myself, it was kind of like, eh, you're too far gone. Um, so I created my company uh, just basically three months into that experience. I cobbled together a voice controlled cell phone system. I'd be tooling down the hallway. At that time, I didn't have them used in my arms yet. I'd be tooling down the hallway and I'd be chatting on the phone and people would say, geez, where'd you get that? I want one. And of course, that just kind of naturally uh, continued. First time I was involved with a research project in Cleveland, Ohio. I was flying back and forth from there. Uh, probably, the, from what I learned at the time, the only quad who dared to fly them by themselves. And uh, the, the guys from the airlines, were guys and gals, who were supposed to get you onto the aircraft because, quite frankly, in the United States today, the airlines is the last vestige of public transportation that's not accessible. They say, hey, we'll just get you out of your wheelchair, throw your wheelchair in the cargo hold because it's just luggage, and we'll throw you in one of our seats, which is extremely uncomfortable, and then we'll break your wheelchair because, hell, you don't need it when you get there. And 80% of all wheelchairs that go on an airplane get destroyed. Um, it took 15 or 16,000 complaints to the United States government before they went, huh, we've got a problem. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, and so there I cobbled together a, kind of a, just a simple sling with handles that you can lift somebody out of a wheelchair, get them into an aircraft seat, and that's still in use today, unfortunately, because I've tried to change the airlines, and that's like beating your head against your head against a brick wall over and over, and eventually you decide you've got a headache. <laughs> um, so that's my background, where I got to to where I am today. Um, I need somebody to act as my assistant. <laughs> I brought a couple just show and tell items. Uh, then I'll uh, go ahead and just take them out and I'll kind of put them out and we talk about things. What I really focus on is how we as humans interact with the world around us in technology. In my space, that's called assistive technology. When I go to a conference and I talk about that, I say there is no such thing as assistive technology. People, but that's why we're here. There is only technology. And we all interact with it in some way that some designer said, well, this is the common way that most people are going to want to utilize this thing. The chair you're sitting on is at a certain height because the average person has an average height. If you're really short, that chair is not very comfortable for you. And if you're really tall, it's the same scenario. Geez, if all chairs were height adjustable, it'd be perfect, right? Um, again, why I say there's no such thing as assistive technology how many, did anybody fly here, fly within the last week? Okay. You flew up from, from, did you get here in an airplane or did you flap your arms really fast? <laughs> right, so that airplane is a piece of assistive technology because none of us can fly, right? So I, I kind of challenge this concept that disabled people somehow need dis different technology. They don't. They just need technology that's designed for their abilities. And that's what I create, ultimately. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pass this around. Since we were talking about video gaming, uh, about five years ago, I had some parents calling me and saying, what do you got for you know, my kid for Christmas? I'm not, admittedly, a big video gamer. I'll play against buddies or something, you know, two-person head-to-head where you kind of shoot each other. And and I, I kind of said, well, geez, that doesn't seem like a big priority, but let me look into it. At the time, what they would give you, some of, some of the other folks in, in my industry, is they'd say, here's a joystick, and here's a button. Go play a video game. Of course, my customers are the guys coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan who have been playing Call of Duty 4 with their squad mates, and they say, hey, I don't have any use of my arms. I can move my head. Let me play Call of Duty 4, which requires two joysticks and 12 buttons. <laughs> That was a challenge. Like I heard my first reaction was, I'm not so sure. So that controller right there that I'm passing around is one that I use, somebody like myself, who has arm movement but little or no hand dexterity. I can ma manipulate both joysticks. We took into account ergonomics because the, the joysticks are out at shoulder width. As a quad, if I put my hands together, my shoulders hunch forward. 
and I start getting back pain. It's got big buttons you whack with your fist. Built inside are sip and puff switches, so while I'm wearing that headset telling my buddy, haha, I just killed you, I can just <laughs> blow a puff of air to fire the gun, sip a bit of air to zoom in the scope, and I never have to take my hands off the joysticks. I've actually had other gamers, professional gamers, who said they want that, <laughs> and their buddies say, no, that's not fair. <laughs> well, that kind of, I, I want to digress on that, that's not fair. At the recent Olympics, there was a, uh, a person who had both legs amputated. He said, I want to run, not in the, not in the, excess, uh, the disability division, I want to run against fully able-bodied athletes. And the fully able-bodied athletes said, that's not fair. You have artificial legs. They're ad advantageous. And to me, the day that I, I literally cried hearing that, because when technology or the assistive technology, alternative technology gets to the point that it is superseding, not only is it augmenting the abilities you lost, but it's enhancing your abilities beyond what the, the average human is capable of. That, that's a, well, that's, I mean, that pushes us into whole new realms that we can't even imagine. But when it comes to the Olympics and the other Olympians say, no, that's not fair, you have lost your legs, you literally can't walk unless you put these springs on your, on your stumps. I, I just think that's phenomenal. But, so that, that controller, what, how this applies to Internet of Things. I'm gonna bring this back around. I'm gonna actually let, go ahead and pass this one around now. This one, if you turn it over and look at it, those of you who are not, not familiar with the video game controller, hold this up next to it, Patrick, will you? Your typical Xbox, PlayStation controller, just hold this up side by side if you will has two joysticks, four buttons on the top left on this side, right? A digital pad or D-pad on this top side. So what this controller does is we kind of laid out the buttons. I don't know if you see the patterns there correspond. This controller is for somebody, literally anybody of any ability, can go online, play any game as an equal, and no one knows you're disabled until you whoop their butt and break. I just beat you with my mouth. That's our premise. Um, so this controller is literally kind of like a 19, this is the next generation of what started as the versatility controller for those guys coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan who said, I would need to play with just my head. And on the back you'll see there's jacks for all the different buttons. We plug in ability switches. So if you, I just ask you, what is your ability? I don't care about your disability. Can you twitch a toe? Can you wink your eye? Can you blow? Can you wiggle your ear? Heck, we'll take advantage of that. Uh, and we plug those into all the various buttons. <coughs> uh, that box originally was built like a 1920s telephone switch box because we needed a grandma to be able to set this up for somebody who's, that, that's who's usually at home to help you. Uh, and grandma admittedly isn't going to plug this into a PC and then start loading an application to reprogram and remap the buttons. So it was as simple as plug it in. What I did now in our next generation, uh, what's built into the Ultimate Arcade and that versatility is I said I initially didn't even have labels on the back. So I gave it to users with just the buttons and no labels. And the end users actually kind of got it, but the therapists and stuff would say, what the hell is this? Oh, I need a manual. And how do I plug this in? What is it? Um, so we gave it defaults. But the concept is I want to map the human body, your abilities, to whatever the game designer intended. The game designer says, you need to push the X button to jump. What if I don't want to? What if I want to hit that other button that's easier for me to utilize? So we, this concept of remapping all the buttons, not a big deal. There's others who do it. Everybody does it. You have to plug it into a PC and install an app and go through this whole thing. We've done it so that you push one button, measure with your hand, a little, the little LED light flashes, and you can reprogram the entire controller just using one hand and one little light. Simplicity is a lot harder to design than complexity. And I challenge all of you to think about that mantra. So I'm going to talk about how Internet of Things comes into play in this. So what we've done there is we've allowed everybody to remap every button. You can set any button to be latching mode, which means it holds the button holds itself down for gas in a racing game. So you don't have to sit there and hold it down. Why bother? Uh, you can set adjustable speed rapid fire. So when you can't push that button really fast like everybody else, it's just as fast, you just hold it down and it does it for you. It compensates for your ability. You can flip the joysticks from left to right because why does the left joystick have to be on the left if you want it on the right? Let's let them flip. Um, 
you can adjust the sensitivity of the joysticks. If you want, when I'm moving a joystick from my shoulder, it's very difficult in, in Gran Turismo, the designer of that, this Japanese guy, he's very, I mean, he's been working on it for 20 years. It's, you just barely nudge that joystick and this car is going to steer all over the place to make it very, feel very realistic like you're driving a race car. If I do that, I'm just banging into the walls. There's no way I can control it. So I turn down the sensitivity, now I've got control. Same thing applies if you're playing with your head or your mouth. I increase the sensitivity so that the smaller movement I have is amplified. So, uh, any questions about that, by the way, in terms of adaptive video gaming before I go on? No? Okay, I'll continue. Is there a challenge across consoles and PC? Do you have to make each one separate or do you have a universal one? These controllers work on PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, Nintendo Wii, just as though you were sitting next to them. That, I think, is where this, what cheap Wi-Fi connectivity is going to do for hardware, much like software as a service, the cloud has done for software. My opinion. Uh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so now eye tracking devices are getting cheaper and cheaper. The Steel Series has a 200 one. Other companies have ones that are lower than 500. And some uh, designers are starting to incorporate controlled eye tracking into their games. Is that something at all you're looking into? I don't know what the price point of those controllers that you distribute are. Um, well, these are handmade here in the USA and everything else. So they cost about a thousand dollars. Okay. Uh, we have to spend a few hours on the phone with each customer. You know, we're not mass producing something, we're not putting it at Walmart where you get no customer service. We have to provide high levels of customer service, which is far more expensive. I could sell a controller for $300 and I'd have to support it. Right. Um, eye tracking is an interesting thing. I get asked about it a lot. I'm not a fan of it. It's very cumbersome, it's hard to use. It's kind of neat because we all move our eyes. Uh, and it's something that somebody, even if they're can't move anything else that can move their eyes. So there are some people that it applies to, but what I see happening, at least in my field, in my space, is the companies who sell eye tracking devices, they sell for about $10,000 oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And Medicare, Medicaid have billing codes for them, and they'll pay for them. So if you are a vendor, you're gonna sell that person a $10,000 device instead of a $800 device that they can get by with that might actually work a lot better, because eye tracking is cool, it's sexy, and you can make more money on it, and insurance will pay for it. So I'll have customers who get given an eye tracking device, and then they'll come and get one of my simple quad mice uh, that they'll pay for themselves because it works easier and it's better, and the eye tracking device sits in the corner. Mm -hmm. um, the quad mouse, by the way, has two simple little joysticks. You nudge with your mouth or your lips. You don't even need to move your head, and it's just directional control, up, down, left, right, move the mouse cursor. Uh, another joystick, nudge it to the left to left click, right to right click, simple. Plug it in, no drivers, grandma can help you with it, that kind of thing. Um, so does eye tracking have an application? Yes. Very interesting from a research perspective and knowing where people are looking like when you're doing, a, if you're uh, researching marketing especially. Um, is it the end all solution to every user interface? I don't think so. Yep. Can you discuss your, your Wi-Fi leverages and some of the um, networking lessons Necessities or limitations. Like I'm, I'm working right now with Qualcomm's um, go, by, go by chip, and like, do you need to have that sort of on some type of platform or uh, network already? Um, that's the greatest challenge. That that, that's the challenge we have today. I mean, with yeah. all the, I mean, one of the thing I like about the Spark IO stuff is it's they already have the cloud for us. Okay. Um, you know, it's got to be able to connect without the person having to go and figure out how do I log into it, how do I fill in my internet password, and all these kind of things. Those are the challenges. It's got to be able to like pull it out of the box and it works. Yeah. It's already connected to the Wi-Fi. You don't need the passwords and security. There's some <laughs> quick and easy way to accomplish that. Push the button on your Wi-Fi, push the button on this one, NFC. You know, is another way around that. Tap them together and now they're linked up. Uh, but it has to be to that point where you pull it out of the box and it works. No programming, no setup, no trying to, these things don't have a display. They don't have a user interface. They don't have a keyboard, right? So they got to work. By the way, the way I'm probably going to be doing that myself today, 
It's just because of the cost and so forth is we might just give them a Wi-Fi router with it. You know. It's 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 why I, I haven't deployed things through Wi-Fi up to today because we we can't go out there and we can't open ports on their net router and all that. It's just too complicated. Um, I mean, can it be done? Of course, but you need to have this huge network of dealers and so forth. Yes. So, do you do you have uh, any products yet that you've been able to put this support function on, or anything? Or, or maybe a better question is like, what would be the first product you would put that functionality on this hardware as a service type? I'm starting simple, like I said, that bed controller. Mm -hmm. um, that's one. I mean, it's really just taking. I've already talked to a company about making us one, and we're putting together Bluetooth, infrared, a bunch of relays. Uh, Wi-Fi, you know, putting that all, and once we've got it, then it's just a matter of how do we use it. <laughs> um, and really, uh, I'm looking for people who are interested in actually changing the world. Oh, that was a piece I didn't touch on. Do I, am I running out of time? Yes. No, oh, we're okay. okay. Everybody here, every, I think people, we all want to think like what we're doing is important, right? I talked about how I was working with the cell phone manufacturers, and I never, nobody ever said thanks. My cell phone crashed one last time. We like want to make, we want to know we're making a difference in the world. And I think today, I know I could go and get a corporate job and probably make three times as much money as I do. I'm kind of like a nonprofit. And, oh, it's a whole other thing. I have everything against nonprofits claiming they're a nonprofit who actually are paying, you know, making millions of dollars. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, if you don't declare a profit at the end of the year, you don't pay taxes. You're a nonprofit. It's my definition. But anyway. Uh, if any of you know someone or are interested in yourself, I'm working on this stuff. I can't afford to pay a couple hundred thousand en dollar engineer, uh, but we actively are changing the world. I can demonstrate definitively today in the last 10 years, I have changed the world, and that's why I do what I do. Uh, it's very rewarding. I have customers who don't understand it. They're just, they just became disabled, and they get very angry. They're, well, they're angry at the world anyway. Everybody goes through that process for three years. Uh, that's a whole other topic, but uh, and and they don't understand that this stuff didn't exist when we didn't create it in there, and so we, that frustrates me when I'm doing customer service. But every every week or every two weeks, we get somebody who calls us up and says, "Oh my God, thank you, you changed my life. I thought I was going to be living in a nursing home, now I'm living at home in my own apartment. Um, you know, going back to school, going back to work, whatever the case may be. Um, that's." That's really what I'm about, what I do. And so I'm looking for enthusiastic people who want to participate in whatever way to help create that next generation of, I can't afford the basic research myself, but I'm turning it into real world products. And really that whole concept of remapping the world is where we're going, but we're going to start small bits and pieces and then expand on it. Um, so, yeah, where are we starting? Just simple and uh, using that, kind of proving it, taking baby steps, and then it's growing on it. Um, I want to use the, there's, there's voice controllers, uh, little voice chips that you can use with Arduino and Raspberry Pi. Uh, we'll go to that, that's probably the next, that's a very sexy um, type of application. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's just a matter of getting the time and resources to get there. It's interesting that you're talking about the human factor and how human factor kind of decides about your interface to these uh, whatever uh, equipment and uh, to make the, the, the device a little bit more general, this is what they don't like because it, it gets to be less intuitive to be used. But it would be interesting to kind of uh, talk to some people in the human factor side about you know, what if I don't have this? What can I do about it for the gaming or for the different type of activity? Mm -hmm. and you might get some different feedback <coughs> from the from the human factor expert. I would say. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, try try controlling your TV. Put put boxing gloves on, and then go around your house and control everything. You're gonna have a whole different perspective, right? <coughs> Um, and that applies if you're elderly and you're losing dexterity, you have arthritis. There's lots and lots of factors I can, you know, in different examples. Uh, 
one of the most eye-opening experiences is you know people will go through these. It's more about a disability awareness thing, but uh, for I, I I speak from that perspective, right? But you go uh, if if you were a, a builder of sidewalks, for example, and you want to get somebody to see how crooked and rough and things you want you want a smoother sidewalk, put them in a wheelchair and have them go across town for the day. They're going to come back with a very different experience, right? Uh, much like if you're build a road builder, take the shocks out of a car and then drive down the road. Um, you know, you're gonna, that person's going to some, suddenly pay attention in a whole different way. Um, I coincidentally, right out of college, I was in civil engineering, and I had an internship monitoring the roadways and so forth. And, and uh, we've seen a huge difference in the roads, the way they're built today, than they were even 20 years ago, uh, because it was all about you started getting bonuses based on the smoothness of the road. And the whole road improved. <laughs> it's like, who cares about how long it takes or anything else? Just how smooth is it? <laughs> um, and, and the roads we're seeing built today, I don't know if anybody's paid attention, I've noticed when I'm driving down the road, especially I'm driving with hand controls, which I don't particularly like, uh, that are drive-by wire, so it's super sensitive. Um, I hit the littlest bump, and boy, I can feel it. Um, and yeah, you see the new roads are just smooth as day because you make more money if you make a smooth road. Yes? How big is the um, the assistive video gaming uh, section within the ever-growing video game market? Like, what what is what size does that represent in the market? Well, there's no statistic out there specifically to video gaming because nobody's ever probably looked at it or tracked it. Um, in fact, just a few years ago, the Christopher Nada Reeves Foundation finally did a study on how many actual uh, spinal cord injury persons there was in the United States because prior to that, the the government statistics <laughs> said there was 11,000 new people each year, and then they found out those numbers were so far off. It was, which literally would have said there were 200,000 people in the United States that had spinal cord injury. And when they actually did the first survey on it, they found it was actually in the many millions. Um, uh, today, I'd say conservative estimate numbers that are out floating around out in the industry: 20% of the population has some sort of disability. Uh, that could be. You know, color blindness, uh, hearing impairments, arthritis, all, all, all kinds of things that are hidden that people don't see or know. Um, uh, two and a half percent to five percent of the population has a disability that you can see and observe and you're aware of. And roughly one to one and a half percent have a very, ser you know, something like they're in a wheelchair like myself, have a mobility impairment, something that's causing them significant difficulty in inter interacting with the world, interacting with the environments, and so forth. Uh, for example, today, I came in, I was driving all around trying to find a place to park and get out and get in the door, because the main door that GPS directed me to, to Keller Hall, had stairs. Yeah. And, and then right across the, do the road was the, uh, the parking ramp. But the parking ramp things are all automated now. You have to reach out, push the button, which is way down here. And you have to be able to grab the ticket and pull it out because it quite, has quite a bit of resistance on it because they don't want the wind to blow it out. So I can't park in a parking ramp unless there's an attendant sitting in there and they've all automated now. So all those booths are always empty. I go to the airport or something and I'm sitting there and literally there'll be a pile of 10 cars behind me honking their horns. And I'm like waving and finally somebody comes up and I'm like, would you pull that ticket out for me? So I'm stuck. I can't get out. Um, so if, if we do think about the human factor, an example as you talk about human factor. Uh, in the 1970s, when they first started making curb cuts, people said, quite admittedly, and I understand why, that's a waste of money. We don't need these. Like, why are we doing this? Uh, and then as they started doing it, every mother with a baby carriage started using them. Every delivery man with his truck cart started using them. And now we're seeing them put, not even on the corners, but in the middle of, you know, the, middle of the roads and stuff. Because it became something that was beneficial to everyone. The concept of universal design is if you make it work for everyone, it will work better for everyone. Uh, that's been demonstrated when you have a, a park and there used to be four graduate steps going up. And they would monitor it beforehand, how many people tripped and fell and different things when they weren't paying attention, they're reading a book, and then they ramped it and, and the, 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 the traffic flows, flows so, much, so much smoother. That's why you're seeing a new like stadiums and stuff, the designs. You want to get people in and out faster. When you make it, when you actually design it to be wheelchair friendly, it, it just the 
flow of people is faster because they're not having to navigate steps, they're not having to watch what they're doing. It just works better for everyone. Um, I they had that in the, in the 60s when they built that stadium. I don't know if anybody ever went, but I'm old enough to, everything was wet. There weren't too many stairs until you got to the actual place. <coughs> but you could get up to the fourth floor by an exterior ramp that ran, and that was all four corners of the building. And like the new, new ones don't have it, which is ridiculous. Have, um, for to the uh, concept of basically making things so that grandma can can configure it mm -hmm. have you thought about yet or, or put thought into how are you going to set the password i see that as a potential challenge if you if you want somebody because i mean security is a big issue in iot right so it's like get rid of the password <laughs> how do you, you but then nfc i mean nfc is another uh, simpler technology of course it's not built in and everything Right. But over time, it would come in where you just touch Is that a challenge? Up. Absolutely. Yeah. It is a challenge. But that's the answer. You know, not to, not to uh, insult anybody's grandmother. There's many very intelligent <laughs> grandmothers out there, I'm sure. But mine wasn't very techy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I just met a friend of mine who's like 85 years old. And uh, he had the same problem. I mean, he didn't even know what is the password because his uh, you know, grandson uh, set it up, and that's it, you know? So now you go there, and he's just like, ah, I have no idea, Hassan, can you set, set it up? <laughs> My mom's in her 70s, and she's a Cisco programmer, so we really don't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, well, let's give Mark a big hand.